what does serverless even mean in 2024? Well, obviously you're here because you just clicked this video and you're wondering that exact question. And you're probably listening to this because you're a developer. Maybe you've been developing for many, many years. Maybe you're new to software development, but whatever it is, you're here because you're interested in what serverless actually is. And I want you just to take a moment and then ask yourself the question. Really, really think of it. When you think of serverless, what does that actually mean to you? So now imagine for a second, now you've got that thought in your head that you need to start building something new, a new application, a new feature, a new service, and you zoom out and you look at the state of the world today. Now imagine for a minute your current company, whoever it that is that you're working for, loves containers. They love building with containers and they love the power of Kubernetes. Wait, what? I'm not allowed to say that. This is a serverless YouTube channel, right? Sorry, go again. They love containers. They love the value of working with that container orchestrator that we're not allowed to talk about. You value the order that working with containers brings to your world. It gives you that same feeling you got back when you were deploying to servers. To work in this way, you don't need to understand anything new, anything different. You can build with containers with the same tools, the same technologies that you're used to, and then package them up and deploy them in a way that feels familiar. And as humans, we all love familiar, cozy things like a nice warm jumper on a cold winter's day. There's a catch. The familiar has its downsides. Scalability, resilience, these things are your problem now. Yes, you in there. And whilst they might not be your problem personally, somebody somewhere in your company needs to manage these things. And that's before you even consider the utilization of the infrastructure that running the container orchestrator that nobody needs to talk about needs. Underutilizing compute is a problem that just doesn't go away. It just shifts around and sustainability is all of our responsibilities. So then you look over to the world of serverless with your application that you need to build. You hear the promise of scalability, of resilience, of things scaling all the way to zero and you only paying for exactly what you use, of being reactive with your compute and only utilizing your resources exactly when you need them, of being able to, as a developer, write code, push code, and it just runs. But honestly, I know how it feels. It feels a bit unknown, doesn't it? A bit scary. You need to learn a new way of building, of thinking about systems. You need to learn about event-driven architecture, about how to understand these different Lego pieces of serverless services that have just been pieced together and you want to understand exactly how they're working. And actually, when you look at your serverless architecture diagrams, they look a lot more complicated, don't they, than your nice, neat container image that's packaged up and ready to ship straight out. And you actually wonder to yourself, is it all worth it? And that's before you even consider the fact that every single service ever released at the moment seems to be serverless. So what does it even mean? Should you just stay with the comfortable, with the way you've been building applications for a while? Or should you live outside your comfort zone a little bit? Live where the magic is. This is where you can become the hero. And actually, this whole conversation about containers or serverless is something that you probably don't even need to care about. So coming back to the question, what does serverless actually mean in 2024? Because it has come a little bit diluted, become overused, maybe even a little bit of a buzzword. Shh. And the way you should think about serverless is as a spectrum, not as a binary decision. You don't have to choose to be serverless or not be serverless. Serverless is a way to reduce your operational overhead as much as possible. And you can choose to be more or less serverless based on the specific needs that you have as a developer. Now, at one end of this serverless spectrum, you have functions, things like AWS Lambda. You write your code, you ship your code, and it kind of just works. It just runs. Think back to the first time you ever used Lambda. I'm sure you had an experience that went something like this. You wrote some code, you pushed some code, and then actually the code just worked. And before you knew it, you had a fully functioning application. And the infrastructure behind that application was fully managed and operated by AWS. And if you hadn't noticed, AWS are pretty good at managing infrastructure. And here's the cool thing. Thinking about serverless in this way as a spectrum gives you some cool options as a developer, because at the other end of this spectrum, you have things like virtual machines, EC2 instances. And then somewhere around here in the middle, you have containers. 
And you don't need to lose your lovely containers. They're nice little packaged pieces of cord that you love to ship. And in fact, the AWS serverless hero, AJ Stivenberg, did some really wonderful analysis on this and actually made a case for why containers should be your default choice for running applications on Lambda. And when you come all the way down to the code level, you don't actually have to lose any of the frameworks and tools that you know and love. If you take a typical web API, I've got a web API here packaged up as a Docker image. I can run that. I get an application running on port 8080 on my machine. It doesn't actually matter what this application is behind the scenes. And you can take that exact container image exactly as it is, pick that up and deploy that into AWS Lambda. You can use container images to package up your function, and then you can use things like the Lambda Web Adapter, which is another video somewhere on this channel talking about, which will allow you to run existing web applications inside AWS Lambda. And if you're not building web APIs, if you're building backend services that are processing messages from queues, you can also use similar code to what you're used to. Now, the fact this is .NET application code is largely irrelevant. What I want to show you here is how you can use the exact same ways of writing code regardless how you're running it. So if I was going to run this application as a container on a container orchestrator that we still can't talk about, I would have a call to receive the messages from my SQSQ, and then I'd iterate over the messages one by one. You'd process the messages, add the process messages to a list of things to delete, and then you'd make a call out to delete the message batch from SQS. And then one second later, you'd try again. And every second, this running worker is going to be checking SQS to see if there's anything to do. And if there's nothing there to be done, this code is just running and not actually doing anything, costing you money, costing us all resources. If you were to take this exact same system and run that in Lambda instead, your code looks almost identical. Instead of having the call to get the messages from SQS, the actual SQS event is just passed into your function as an event payload. You're still going to iterate over all of the messages that have come from SQS. And this time, instead of actually grabbing all your successful messages, you're going to grab a list of all your failed messages, pass that list of failed messages back to Lambda, and that will delete any messages from the SQS queue that were successful and leave any in the queue that failed. And the important thing here is that you're still packaging your code as a container. You're still looping over SQS messages. You're still processing records from Kafka if that's what you're using. However, the difference is AWS are handling all of that communication with the queue with Kafka on your behalf. And when there are no messages there to work with, your code isn't actually running. It's not costing you anything. It's not using any resources. So you can just take these container images, package these container images, ship them up to AWS, and AWS is going to handle everything else for you. And the real beauty of all of this is that now you have a container image, you can run it anywhere. A point of fear you will inevitably come across when you research functions is cold starts. Cold starts are the time it takes for a function environment to react to an event, scale up, and then service your request. And whilst AWS have released data showing that under steady state load, this affects less than 0.1% of traffic, this can still be a problem. And in your budding journey as a serverless developer, this is going to give you pause for thought. And you start to think, wouldn't it be easier just to step back into comfort, to step back into the wonderful world of container orchestrators and that orchestrator that we're still not allowed to talk about? Are we allowed? To? No, we're not allowed to talk about it. You could take the easy way out, roll back, deploy things the same way you always have. But remember, now you have a container image, a container image that's using the same web framework that you're working with. So guess what? You can take that exact same container image and deploy that to a different service. And you can still be on the serverless spectrum, but maybe just slightly off the far end. Maybe you're kind of here somewhere using something like AppRunner or ECS Fargate. You can run containers in something like a serverless way. Now, the purists will, rightly so, I must add, argue that serverless services must scale to zero. And whilst I agree with that, and in a perfect world, everything is pay-per-use and everything scales to zero, as you all know, the world isn't perfect. Your life as a software developer is simply one big collection of trade-offs. And just because your Lambda doesn't fit exactly into the Lambda paradigm, 
doesn't mean you need to jump off the other end of the serverless spectrum and take on all of this responsibility yourself. If you took that exact same Web API container image, deployed that to Amazon ECS with Fargate, you have pretty much the same operational overhead as you would with Lambda. Apart from the fact you maybe need to think about when your workload's going to scale up and down, but upgrades, resilience, scalability, this is not your responsibility. And again, you've got the might of AWS managing your infrastructure. And to reiterate, AWS are pretty good at it. So combining these two approaches give you something of beauty, actually. You've got long running processes for low latency web facing workloads that need to respond really quickly to delight your users. And then you've got these reactive event driven functions that are performing the bulk of your hard work, reacting to events, running exactly when they need to and optimizing cost and resource consumption. Of course, there are many different ways to build modern software systems. And the question I have for you now is which one are you going to choose? You can go and be safe. You can follow the trends. You can take on all your own operational responsibility and spend a not insignificant portion of your time dealing with upgrades. Or you can choose to step out, to be more serverless, whether that's as serverless as you can possibly be using functions or slightly less serverless using some kind of container orchestrator. But remember, if you're a developer who hates networking, who hates server upgrades and cluster management as much as I do, then maybe thinking about how you can be more serverless for your next project might be a good idea. So serverless in 2024, reducing your operational overhead, letting all of you be the heroes, letting all of you focus on writing code, on doing things that you love, on delivering value and delighting the people who use the systems that you build. So embrace the unknown, step out, go on, try it. I know you won't turn back.